I want to thank everybody again for joining us for a Tuesday Bible study. For those online, guess what? This is actually a live service today. You get to be a part of our service and uh, see the Bible study. Of course, we do have worship beforehand and a little bit of, uh, we do Holy Communion as a part of that. You are always welcome to join us as a part of that service too, if you'd like. Um, we would actually prayed, but I remember that it's kind of our tradition online to begin with prayer. So let's uh, start with prayer and ask God's uh, invite God to be present with us, God's Holy Spirit to work on us as we look at the book of Colossians today. Heavenly Father, we do ask you to bless us as we open up this book and help us again to be inspired by the words of Paul and to understand what it is he's trying to tell us. These are very complex lessons, and so we ask you to continue to be with us and open up our hearts to your word, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, you remember we started the book of Colossians uh, the other week. And a lot of it was introductory self stuff, Paul and Apostle, blah, 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 and, you know, commending them for their faith. But remember last week we talked about how they were lacking in wisdom. What they were lacking in is they didn't know how best to love other people. They didn't have the wisdom of God. Uh, they, they loved God, but they needed wisdom to know how best to love people around them. Remember, this was the operative word. Love is the oper operative word of Christianity, and love is not a law. That's the problem with love. It's so easy to follow the law. The law says, don't kill anyone. <laughs> okay, I haven't killed anyone recently. But um, wisdom, uh, to know how to love people, is something different. You have to do more than just not kill somebody. You have to actually find how best to love them. And we talked about how that's different depending upon the person. That's why Paul was saying that we need wisdom to know how best to apply God's love in this world. And then we go on to this. Now, I told you that the biggest problem with reading Paul's works is that Paul writes in these enormous run-on sentences that uh, don't make any sense. He'd get an F in English. Well, he wrote in Greek. He'd get an F in Greek. It's not even good Hebrew. He got enough in Hebrew. He's just a bad writer in terms of how he writes. In fact, I'll tell you what, he has a lot of misspellings in his words, too. That's one of the things that's so challenging about reading uh, uh, the Bible in Greek, especially when you get to Paul's work. He was a horrendous writer. Now, I give him credit for this. He's writing in probably his third or fourth language. You know, he speaks, you know, Hebrew. He speaks and writes Aramaic. He probably speaks and writes, you know, Latin. He probably then has Greek. And so he's got all these languages, and I give him credit, I couldn't do this. But honestly, it is so difficult to read that. But what it does indicate to us when he writes these long sentences, you have to understand they are to be taken together. What we do as Christians is we see the, the periods in the sentences and say, oh, there's an end of the idea, and we take that one idea in that sentence and develop it and create a theology based upon it, that's not what Paul wants us to do. And so we can create these very, very complex theologies by taking one verse at a time, and Paul, you're not supposed to read Paul that way. How does this, what's his, what you're supposed to do when you're reading Paul is you're supposed to find that really fine thread that runs through the entire sentence and what pulls it all together. And don't get caught up in all the details when you're reading Paul. Find out what the thread is trying to pull. And that's how you figure what Paul is doing. And the only way to do that is to understand this as a whole. So let's take a look at this. So we already told you about wisdom and how love is, the, uh, love is going to help us to find, you know, how we best love people. We need wisdom for that. And we get into this week's lesson starting verse 15. Uh, because, again, he ends with, how we know love through what Jesus Christ has done, his redemption, his forgiveness, his love. That's how we know wisdom. So that was the ending of last week. And then we get to verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. He meaning, I have no uh, eraser. That's not what it means, by the way. <laughs> All right, hang tight. Walk it off frame to the people online. Okay, he being Jesus, okay, he is the image of the invisible God, okay, the image. Um, we are made in the image of God, 
But I think Paul means something a little bit more than that. You know, Genesis 1, you and I are the image of God. Um, we're, but he is the firstborn of all creation. That's not us. We, our lineage goes back to Jesus, or to uh, Adam and Eve, right? Jesus predates that, is what he's trying to say. So he's making a claim that Jesus is more than just an ordinary man, right? He is something that pre-existed humanity, something beyond that. For in him, all things in heaven and on earth were created. There you go. We're in the image of God, but we don't create the heavens and the earth. Things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him. Now you know where we get this really flourishy type of language in our creeds, right? A lot of this comes from a lot of Paul's words. So our creeds, by the way, are not biblical, but they're based upon what the Bible says. And often you will see where the language is captured from certain books. So you hear certain, uh, uh, you hear in this verse, in verse 16, some of the creeds that we, we speak. We go on, verse 17. He himself, again, we're talking about Jesus, is before all things, in, all th in, all, in him all things hold together. Uh, this kind of sounds like the Nicene Creed, right? He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might have first place in everything. So there's this idea of this headship. He is first, the headship of Christ. He is before all things. He is in charge of all things. I always said that our relationship with God with each other is a triangle. This is true of every relationship. Me and you, we are on the exact same plane. We're equals. We are called, as Paul says, to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Well, wait a minute. This is where we people get all caught up. But who's the head? Who's the head of the household? Not me. But you're the man. So what? I'm not the head of the household. Who's the head of a Christian household? Jesus is the head. We submit to one another, and there is a head. The head is Jesus. If we submit to Jesus, we don't get in any conflicts. The conflicts come when we don't have wisdom to know how best to love each other. We have not submitted to Jesus Christ. This is the argument that Paul is trying to make here. Okay? So we go on, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Not a portion. Jesus, you know, when Jesus came, when we talk about God with us, Emmanuel, all the fullness, think about the impact of this phrase, all the fullness of God has come to dwell amongst us in Jesus Christ. So when, I, when I've often said to you that, you know, Jesus isn't just a messenger of God, Martin Luther King Jr., messenger of God. Martin Luther, messenger of God. John Calvin, messenger of God. I hope I'm a messenger of God. Jesus is the message, right? Jesus is God. He's making an argument. And you know that there are uh, what the Jehovah Witness claim that, well, Jesus isn't God. He's just an ordinary human being. The Latter-day Saints, Jesus is just local boy made good, right? No, according to Paul, Jesus is something beyond us. We may be made in the image of God, but we are, he is something transcendent and beyond us. And so Paul is really hammering this, okay? That, and, and maybe this is what was deficient in the wisdom of the Colossians. They were turning to Jesus as their head. They're trying to love each other, but... How do you love each other if you don't know who the head is, right? This is where wisdom comes from. So in the fullness of God is pleased to dwell in him, and through him, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether in heaven or on earth, making peace through the blood of the cross. To reconcile all things. Wait a minute. Does that mean the animals? All things. Does that mean my broken relationship with whoever? My uncle or my our father or our mothers or this? All things. Jesus Christ has come to reconcile these relationships. 
This is who Jesus is for us. So he set this up that if we're going to have wisdom, if we're going to know how best to love each other, this is the source of that wisdom. Do you see how that's the string that's pulling this together with the section beforehand? Okay? We're not done with this yet. Oh, we keep going. You who were once estranged, okay, did you, okay, verse 20, what is it again? Who is Jesus? The one who reconciles all things. Verse 21, and you who at one time were unreconciled, who were estranged, who were in broken relationship, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death so as to present you, okay, Greg, you ready for this? Holy and blameless. He presents you holy and blameless. Remember how we had this theme last week that he starts with the idea that you are saints of God. Do you see how we, this, this strand just keeps weaving through this? And he just keeps weaving this in and weaving out. It's a very complex argument, but ultimately he's saying, where does your holiness, your blamelessness come from? Remember the word holy. It doesn't sound this way in English, but the word holy and saint are the exact same word. Hagios. Okay? Holy. Saintly. It's the same word. Um, it can be used as an adjective. It can be used as an noun. Much of the way English words are, depending on how it's structured. Okay? But it's the exact same word. So our holiness, our saintliness isn't something that we do. Where does it come from again? From Jesus. Does that make us feel better about the fact? Because, you know, we talked about this last week and said, you know, but I don't feel very holy. I don't feel like I'm a saint. There have been so many better people in life. Sure. But being a saint isn't about being a good person. Well, you will. I hope be a good person. But it's about what Jesus has done to reconcile us. He has set us apart. We are saintly because of what he has done. This is the argument he's trying to make. He's trying to get us to think about ourselves and about others differently. So, you know, that person you get in a running fight with or an argument with, I can't believe you cut me off. Guess what? That's a person whom God has chosen to reconcile to him, a saint of God, okay, by what God has done. And we're sitting here shaking our fist or worse, giving the middle finger to this person, right? Remember who you're giving that to. Somebody chosen by God. We may be upset with them, but we might need to rethink how we think about people with whom we disagree. If I'm holy and I'm blameless because of what Jesus Christ has done for me, that means he wants to reconcile those people too. This is an exclusive club, Jesus and me. He does reconciles who? All things. This is what Paul is arguing here. All right, let's go on. So he's, provided holy, he's presented as holy and blameless, irreproachable, provided, okay, this seems like, okay, provided that we continue securely, established and steadfast in the faith. Well, again, we're put in the faith by Christ. We can turn our backs on that. It makes it sound like it's Paul is saying something about us having to work in some way. It's not about our work. It's about the fact that God has done this for us. He's just saying, just don't turn your back on it, man. Just don't turn your back on it. Because we're securely established by what Christ has done for us, not by something that we do. Don't make this into a work. So we are not to shift from the hope that is promised to us in the gospel that we've heard before, which is proclaimed to every creature under both heaven and earth, okay? For which I, Paul, have become a servant of the gospel. So, Paul starts with, let me just pull this thread again. Remember, we told you, Paul is arguing, this is all one sentence. Paul is pulling this together simply this. Your, uh, let me write this down so everybody can see this visually. Okay. 
and to try to pull this together the best I can. You are a saint. How can I be a saint? I'm a jerk sometimes. True, I am a jerk sometimes. Uh, I'm a saint. Wait a minute. But, you, you know, and, I, and I, I know I'm a jerk because I don't always love people the way I'm supposed to. Well, but we're called to love each other. Well, great. How do I know how best to love each other? Well, by having wisdom. So you're a saint. Be a saint by loving other people. Well, where do I get wisdom? By believing in Jesus. Well, what does that do for me? Well, he's the one that reconciles me. So that I can be saintly. So let's put this another way. What is Paul arguing? You are a saint. Therefore, be a saint. Because that's how God has made you. You are capable of being saintly because you are a saint because of what Jesus has done. And he has shown us how to be a saint and how to love one another if we just submit to him as the head of our lives and the lives of the church, in the life of the church. Whew. So who are you again? You're a saint of God, chosen by God, called to love those around us. We love God by gaining the wisdom through understanding that Jesus Christ is our head, who reconciles us and brings us back together as we ought to be. So what does this mean for us in this world today? We are really in, we're really in trouble. We have some Christians who are proclaiming this message that we will reconcile this world through certain political activities. That is such dumb. That's so dumb. It's dumb. The politics of this world cannot reconcile the heartache that's going on in Ukraine or the heartache that's going on in this country because it's Again, not Christ is not at the center of that. We need Christ as the head if we are to transform this world and to reconcile it and to bring us back into relationship with Christ. We need to change. I'm not sure what this all means for us, but I think we have been doing things wrong for, oh, I don't know, the last 2,000 years. We've, we've, we've tried since at least... At, 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 at least uh, the first 400 years, I think, of Christianity, it was a pacifistic moving, uh, movement. But, um, but since Christianity has become the predominant religion of the Western world, we have tried to impose ourselves upon other people. And that is not the way Jesus acts. And that is not the way we are to act. We are to love. Not impose God's will upon people, but to just love them. And know how best through the wisdom and understanding of God and having a relationship with Jesus Christ, know how best to love those around us. And, and we've just been doing it wrong, I think. We need to reconcile with uh, the same way that God has reconciled us. Be the people of peace in this world. Okay. Um, I'm not sure the ending was very good. But I hope that makes some sense. I hope I was able to pull that thread together and uh, just end with this again. You are a saint. Therefore, go and be a saint. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, I don't know how well I did at the end in pulling this together and maybe did more damage than good. But I, I, I just, um, Paul is really appealing to us to be better at loving one another. And the only way we're going to be better at loving one another is to have that wisdom that is rooted in the understanding that we, that you are our head, that that wisdom comes from you. So God, help us to grow in our relationship with you, that we might be better at loving those around us. This world needs us to be a movement of love. We don't need to create another institution. We just need to better love this world. So God, inspire us this day and send us forth in peace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. And now we receive the Lord's blessing this day. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for online joining us too. Thank you, everybody here too.